let him introduce the rest of his family. Bless you, bro. Thanks for having me here this morning, everybody. I promised Enoch that he could come up and, and talk in a minute. So Enoch, you want to come up here and say hi to everybody? <laughs> it's pretty much nap time right now, so we're getting there. Come say hi. Come say hi to everybody. Do you want to say hi to everybody in the microphone? Say hi, everybody. You're beautiful. Ni hi. Yeah. Say hi, everybody. So this is my wife, Jamie, and our two, our two and a half, almost three-year-old son, Enoch. And then Noah is back in the nursery. He was just born in January, so he's sleeping hopefully right now. <laughs> Who knows? All right. Okay, you're going to go have a good nap now? Or do you want to say something? Like, touch in. Touch in. Good job. Good. All right. Any Chinese speakers in here will know that was our best attempt at. See you next time. See you later. <laughs> Um, yeah. We're raising him up as a natural interpreter, so hopefully that'll work out. Right? <laughs> um, I, I do have a, a PowerPoint. It's in the form of a PDF. If you could pull that up, that'd be great. If not, it's only a couple of pictures that you will be missing. So. Um, I'm really grateful to be here together with you guys this morning. Uh, I have known Pastor James for, I guess, a couple of years now. And every time he's in Taiwan, I beg him to come to our church in, in Taipei and speak. And so I thought maybe I could return the favor this time. So we're here. Uh, we've been in the States since the beginning of March. Uh, and we're doing a, a three-month kind of rest a little bit and do some sharing of the vision and some fundraising and also connecting with family and friends. We're originally from Minnesota. So we flew out here to Los Angeles for the weekend. And originally I connected with Pastor James, and then I remembered that there were a few other friends. Uh, and so my weekend, our weekend has been nonstop finding, uh, finding Zhao Ren, finding people, uh, going to meet up with different friends and, and, and getting to know, to meet new friends and to catch up with old friends. So it's really been a blessing to be in the city, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys this morning. I'd like to, to open up our time together just by sharing a little bit about how we uh, got to Taiwan and kind of the vision that we believe the Lord has given us for the ministry there. And then I'd like to, we don't often uh, get to celebrate a lot of holidays that are celebrated more often in the States. So we're going to celebrate a holiday together. And then at the end, I just want to share a little bit more about um, how you can be involved. Um, <clears throat> so in 2008 is when we first moved out to Taiwan. And our experience in Taiwan actually happened by accident. So I was supposed to go to Thailand, which <laughs> probably, probably most people in this room, I hope you know that that's different, but there's a lot of people outside of this world, outside of this room and, and in other parts of you know, the states maybe that, that don't understand that Thailand and Taiwan are two different countries, uh, not even close to each other, different cultures, different everything, but Thai, if you, that's all you hear, then that's what you think. Uh, and so. I was asked, uh, I, I went to Crown College, which is a, a Christian school, and I got my undergraduate degree from there. And while I was attending, they, they sent out missions teams to go on summer missions trips. And I signed up for Thailand because the, the leader of the Thailand team said, hey, Chris, I really want you to come. And when the leader asks you to go, there's a good chance that you're going to get on that team even though there is an application process. So I, I went through with the application process and I remember I was in the room and, and all the tables for the different countries that we were going to were set up. And uh, I filled out the application and it got to the point where you had to say, what, what country do you want to go to? And I wrote Thailand, of course, is my first choice. And then I said, well, you have to fill out three. So I just looked up and uh, I was like, uh, there's Taiwan and Ecuador. Okay, so I wrote down these other countries and I said, okay. We'll, uh, we'll just go to Thailand because that's where I'm going. So I, a couple weeks later, I got my acceptance letter. I opened it up and my, uh, the leader of all the teams had written a letter and said, congratulations, you're going to Thailand. I just thought that he was ignorant like most other people and I said, I, I was gonna set him straight. So I walked with the letter to the office and I said, excuse me, sir, this is supposed to say Taiwan. And I'm not sure if you know or not, but I'm supposed to go to, sorry, yeah, I'm supposed to go to Thailand and this thing says Taiwan. So I'm, I'm very confused. Could you just cross out Taiwan and put Thailand and then I'll go to Thailand? Thank you. And uh, he said, well, we prayed about it and we believe that, that God wants you to go to Taiwan on this trip. I said, 
All right, I guess I'm going to Taiwan. I don't know. Uh, I uh, decided to respect authority and submit, and so we went for it. Uh, and my wife, we weren't married or even dating at the time. We were just friends. She was the leader of the trip. She had also gone to Taiwan the year before as an accident. She was supposed to go to Turkey on a missions trip. <laughs> so it's these T-word countries that are totally different, and then we end up going to Taiwan. So she was supposed to go to Turkey, and then they canceled it because there was some political unrest happening. And they shifted the trip to be in Ximen, which is a, a district in Taipei, Taiwan. And because the goal was to work with youth. So our, our thought was, or her thought was, if she could work with youth, she could go there instead. And so they went, and then uh, a couple weeks before the trip was supposed to happen, they, the, the leader of the team quit. So as a freshman, she took a group of juniors and seniors over to Taiwan and led the team. Uh, it worked out pretty well. So three out of the four years that we were at Crown College, she led teams to Taiwan. I was on the trip the second year. And the last day of the trip, I remember laying in the Rainbow Hotel uh, in Ximen there, right in the middle of everything, and, and hanging out with my two other guy friends that were on the trip. And I just opened my eyes and said, I think I might like Jamie. So two months after that, we started uh, dating. So you don't date on the trip, you date after the trip. <laughs> just a forewarning there, yeah. The, you, you start the relationship after with lots of prayer and lots of working out, out with mentors and other things first. So we, we started dating, we got married, and then our senior year, which is 2008, in the spring, we were praying about kind of what the next step was going to be, and we got a phone call from the leader of our, of our denomination, one of the leaders in our denomination, the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and they were trying to gather a group of people that would go into Sheman and would start a church. And we thought, you know, we'd both been there and had some really powerful experiences with God and sharing the gospel in Sheman. And so we, two weeks after we graduated from Crown, we bought one-way tickets and flew out there. And we just moved out there. We didn't know exactly where we were going to live, although a friend of a friend had said that we could rent half of their building that they were renting. And so we got there thinking that we were going to spend a budget on things at Ikea and then found out that we had to spend our whole budget just to get toilets. So you learn things as you go, but we, we got set up in an apartment and five other people joined us. So seven of us lived together in an apartment building uh, in the Shiman shopping district. And that was in 2008. And we just started praying. Uh, we got jobs teaching English and started to learn Chinese. We just were praying and asking God, you know, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? How do we, uh, in pastor's terms, be spirit led? God has a will. And he's revealing that to us. Uh, he's speaking to us through, through the Spirit. And so when we spend time with him, when we pray, when we seek his will, he reveals that to us and we learn how to live that out. So we started a small group and then we started an English outreach ministry and then we were doing monthly church services in my apartment. So there were about 40 people that would come to our tiny little apartment building, uh, maybe twice the size of the nursery in the back there. And we'd cram in one little room together and we'd sing songs about Jesus and share testimonies. Uh, and, and we began to see the seeds of the original vision that God gave us coming to pass. So if you can scroll down to the next page of the PDF, this is a fun picture that I like to show. When I was at Crown College before I left, I, was, I remember I was in the prayer room praying one time, and I looked up at the map on the wall in the prayer room, and I remember seeing a picture of Taiwan being three times the size of China. Now, if you are... If you know anything about geography, you know that that is, first of all, not true. And if you love China, I'm not saying anything against China at all. I'm just saying that I really believe God really loves Taiwan. And that God really wants to, to bring Taiwan into revival. And I believe that he showed me this picture to say that he loves Taiwan, he loves Taiwanese people. And this was, in, in a sense, our calling to go and to be part of God's work in Taiwan. A little bit later, as I was looking at that picture, uh, I, started to, I felt like I started to see arrows flying out. And I felt like the second step that God said was, as Taiwan comes into revival, that Taiwan is going to be like England was 200 years ago, or like the States was 100 years ago, that Taiwan is going to become a sending nation. It's going to send missionaries to the ends of the earth. And I just said at that moment, God, if there's any way that I can be a part of this, if there's any way that I can go, please send us. We really want to be a part of this. And so that vision, that picture of Taiwan being three times the size of China has been something that has stuck with us for many years. And as Pastor mentioned, uh, there have been 
a lot of months that haven't been very happy, <laughs> that haven't been um, filled with a lot of success. There's still a lot of struggles that we have, but when you get a vision from God, it doesn't have to be that he shows up in a picture on the wall or anything crazy, but when God begins to move in your heart, when he points something out to you, when you have a Bible verse and you're reading it and it's almost like it jumps out at you and starts to shake around in your mind. When, when a friend says something and, it, and that word just sticks with you. When you're praying and, and God shares something with you or, or a pastor is sharing something in the front. Any of these things are different ways that God speaks. And as God begins speaking to you, as he begins to give you a vision, it's something that will captivate your life. It's something that will almost take control. And, and the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and uh, to take a little bit of tran translational liberty, um, when you think about being drunk, I'm sure no one here has been drunk, but maybe you've seen people drunk or acting drunk in a movie. Uh, they're almost out of control. They're, they're, uh, they're doing silly things. They're saying things maybe they wouldn't normally say. Uh, and so Paul in Ephesians, when he says that, he's saying, Look, this is a silly drunk person who's letting all their inhibitions or all their reasons for not doing something, letting their guard down. And when you are controlled by the Spirit, it's not something like, like you're flapping around uncontrollably, although that has happened in the Bible and it happens in life today. I don't mean that you have to shake violently or say stupid things. What I mean is that when you're under the, under, when you are influenced by the Spirit, you're willing to say things in love that you wouldn't normally say. When you're filled with God's spirit, you're willing to go speak to someone who you normally wouldn't speak to. You're willing to give someone a hug who you normally wouldn't want to even touch. And that's a love that God gives you. And, and the, the, Paul talks about in Romans 6, he says that there's a, a baptism that we go through. And he talks about it in Corinthians too. And he connects it with the baptism of the spirit. And it's, it's the work of God through the Holy Spirit to unify us, to connect us with Jesus' death and his resurrection. And so when you, when you get filled up with God's Spirit, when you become a believer, when you begin to encounter his love in your life, you identify, you connect with Jesus' death and resurrection. And so Paul can say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You're not alive anymore, and so you don't have to worry about what other people think. You don't have to worry about what other people are going to say or if they're going to be your friend or not because you're dead to that old self. You're dead to the worries of the world. You don't have to worry if you're going to have money to pay the bills. You don't have to worry if you're going to have the things that, that we all think we need. God takes care of you. He provides for you. And when you identify with my old self is gone, my new self is here, it's a totally new life, and you're free to do whatever God's will is. You're free to be filled up with His Spirit and to walk that life. And that is a life that says no to sin, but not just, let's say no to a list of things we're not supposed to do, but it's a life that says yes to God. And so when you begin to catch a vision, when you have God's word jump out at you or, or a friend shares something, you get a, a picture like this, like, hey, Taiwan is three times the size of China. You get a picture like, hey, people need the Lord in my community. Whatever it is, whatever picture it is that God might be sharing with you, starts to take control of your life and God's spirit starts to fill you up. That was our hope, that we would go to Taiwan, even though some people told us it was a bad idea, <laughs> that we would go to Taiwan and that we would begin to see this, that God would, would work in people's lives and that Taiwan would, in a spiritual sense, become three times the size of China. The world is looking for a place to belong. We all desire to be a part of something. That's why gangs are so popular. That's why people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars to join gaming clubs online to be part of video gaming. That's why people will do silly things and will say silly things because we want to be a part of something. The world wants to belong. And that, I believe, is a hole that God placed in us because we were meant to be in relationship with him. We were meant to have God's love fill up that hole. And when he first created us, we were in perfect relationship with him. We were full of him. And then sin came in and separated us from God. Sin's not just 
God doesn't want me to have any fun, so I'm not allowed to get drunk. God doesn't want me to have any fun. I can't sleep around with my girlfriend anymore. It's not like that at all. Sin is anything that separates us from God. And as it separates us from God, it's because God is holy. And he wants to give you a holy life that is filled with way more joy and way more love and way more power than any of those gangs, than any of that stuff that right now might seem to satisfy in the short period. The world is hungry for something, hungry to, to belong to something, hungry to be part of a family. And that's God's invitation to all of us to be part of his family. And so that's why we created the aroma. Our coffee shop, we can go to the next slide, our church and our mission center is the aroma. And so uh, our goal is that people would be able to come into our coffee shop and that they would start to smell the aroma of Christ. Paul says in Corinthians, we, a collective we, anybody in here who believes in Jesus, we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Do you know that when you become a believer and God starts to change your heart, you give off a smell? I hope it's not one of those nasty ones because we're supposed to take showers. I'm talking about the good kind of smell. I'm talking about when you come into your friend's house and they're baking fresh bread and you just left, you just left an afternoon snack and so you're physically full. You don't actually need any food. But when you come into the house and you smell the fresh baked bread, it's very hard to say no. Even when we seem like we're full. And so you have a slice. Or maybe, in my case, a loaf. When you come, when you encounter the aroma of Christ, you're attracted, you're drawn in. And so our goal is to, to make a coffee shop that has an atmosphere of the aroma of Christ, where people can come in and whether they just drink a cup of coffee or, or have a meal or join an event, whether they just talk with one of the baristas or, or whether they have a long conversation with someone else in the shop, whether they're there for a Bible study or there to just read a book and relax, that the aroma coffee shop would be a place where people can smell God's love, can be drawn in like that baked bread. Whatever's going on in their lives, whatever they've tried to fill their hearts up with, that they would be attracted and drawn into Jesus. And then our next step is our church that meets in the coffee shop, also called the Aroma. We hope that through the church, through Sunday church services and small groups during the week and serving and discipleship, all that good stuff, that people would become the Aroma. That they would themselves learn what it's like to have God's love inside of them and to love each other. Our ultimate goal then is that people would start to go out and would spread the aroma of Christ. That our friends would go to their families. Our friends would go to their jobs, to their schools. That they would spread the aroma. And they would know that wherever they go, they change the atmosphere. They're bringing the fresh baked bread with them. I can tell you stories. I've got a couple. Like my friend Aiden. Aiden uh, works in our coffee shop, and he has been working there for, I think, close to a year now. And Aiden, <laughs> Aiden first came into the coffee shop and was just sitting there with a friend eating a meal late one night, and two of our other workers in the coffee shop were singing loudly some pop music or something. And Aiden thought to himself, this would be a fun place to work. So Aiden came and applied, and now he works at the Aroma, and he's like our head baker. <clears throat> So he bakes muffins, and he bakes bread, and he bakes it all fresh, and it's really good. And Aiden didn't know Jesus before he came. He just thought it would be a fun place to work. So he's working there, and Aiden is beginning as a worker in the coffee shop to smell the aroma of Christ. Just a couple weeks ago, he attended a healing meeting that we did, and some friends prayed for him, and his knees got healed. Aiden is beginning to smell the aroma of Christ through God's supernatural power in his life. And he's doing discipleship with with uh, our friend Cloud, who's on staff in the church. Aiden smells the aroma. Lewis and Renee are friends of ours who've become the aroma. Uh, Renee did an overseas program and studied some, some of her schooling for her master's in England. When she came back, they were looking for a church. She didn't know much about Jesus, but had gone to a couple of Bible studies and wanted more. They found aroma on the internet. And as they started coming, they began to become the aroma. And they were going to get married, Louis and Renee. They were living together, and they wanted to get married, and they asked me if I would marry them. 
And then they came to me and they said, we're going to live separately for the, for, for the last six months before we get married. They had already been living together for several years. They had everything figured out. They, I think, had already bought a house together at that point. And they decided that they wanted to be, she said, I remember Renee said to me, I want to be holy for Jesus. I want to be set apart for Jesus. And so Lewis and Renee allowed themselves to go through the pain of finding another apartment to stay in and paying extra rent and not being able to have the convenience of just ending their evenings together because Jesus is more important to them than anything else. Or maybe my friend Sarah, who originally came to Taipei without a lot of direction. Uh, she's from the States here originally, and she moved to Taipei just to teach English and got involved in our church. And now she signed up to do a two-year residency program that we have within, with Envision, which is the third part, our Spread the Aroma. And so she's going to come back to the States for a couple months, and then she's going to go back and do a two-year residency program to study to be involved in missions long term. We have people that are smelling, becoming, and spreading the aroma all over our, our community. I promised you that I would celebrate a holiday. And one of, uh, one of the holidays that we celebrate a lot in Christendom, in Christianity, is Easter. And if we could back up one week, I'd like to talk about Palm Sunday. Do you guys remember that Palm Sunday happened about a month ago? Very good. Uh, we, don't, we celebrate Palm Sunday a little bit in, in our church. You know, the week before, we share that this is the story of when Jesus came in to, to Jerusalem and he was getting ready to be crucified. If, if you have Bibles, you can open them up to John chapter 12. I'm just going to touch on a couple of things, but I wanted you to open up a Bible so that you can go back home and read it yourself. John 12 tells the story of Mary anointing Jesus' feet. And then it tells the story of Jesus going into Jerusalem on a donkey and coming in and they lay palm branches down on the ground in front of him as he rides in. He's being celebrated as a king. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, I just think it's so awesome. And again, I'm biased, so take it for what it's worth. But Jesus is the, is the aroma in us and Jesus had an aroma put on him just before he went to the cross. Mary anointed him. It says that Mary took a bottle of perfume that maybe was worth a year's worth of wages. So this is expensive. This is the good stuff. Not the stuff that I buy at Walmart. The good stuff. And Mary took this bottle of perfume and she had to break it and she dumped it on him and she washed his feet with her hair. And Jesus said that Mary's going to be remembered for this as long as there is Christianity, as long as we're around. Mary was remembered for this because she sacrificed something great. And that, that great sacrifice that she made ended up being an aroma that stayed with Jesus, I imagine, through most of the rest of that next week. That would have stayed, for him, stayed with him for days. And that as he prepared to go to the cross for us, he was an aroma himself that people smelled. There was a literal physical smell of this perfume on him. He was being prepared to go, and, to, go to the cross and to die for us and then three days later to be raised from the dead. So Jesus is on this journey. And on this journey, he's, he's, he's going to Jerusalem and he's coming in. If we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. I hope I have the right one. I always get nervous when I'm not in control. Also, if the Chinese is wrong, I'm really sorry because I was correcting it on the drive over here and, oops. So I, got, I hope I got close, but anyway. We'll pretend you can't read Chinese. <laughs> Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and he is riding on a donkey and he's being celebrated as a king. Jesus' journey is triumphant in the one hand that he's being celebrated as a king but also terrifying in the sense that he's about to go to the cross and die one of the most gruesome deaths that can be thought up by humanity. The cross, they say, is one of the most difficult things that anyone has ever endured. And Jesus went to the cross for us. So on the one hand, Jesus is going in as a triumphant king, and on the other hand, he's going in as a terrified human being who's about to suffer the most suffering thing that we can think of. It's very similar to the passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul calls us the aroma. Paul says, right before he says we are the aroma, he says, 
we're always being carried along in a triumphant procession. And so Paul says, we're along this journey. And some people believe that Paul's idea here was relating back to Roman generals. So in this time and era, Rome is like the most awesomest country in the world. And Rome and the Roman Empire is going everywhere and conquering everyone. So wherever they go, they pretty much just destroy the other people and then make them become part of their country. And when a Roman general would go, and if they won, they would come back with some of the spoils. They would bring back some of the slaves that they had taken captive, and they would go on a march, on a parade, and a celebration through the streets of Rome. And people would be cheering and yelling, yay, you did more great things for Rome. And the general, to this general, it was a triumphant march. But to the slaves that were going to be put to death in a matter of hours, it was a terrifying march. You see, Jesus, in a very similar procession, went to Jerusalem knowing that he was going to die. And these generals went in a procession, procession being celebrated as great warriors, but walking behind them were people that were about to be put to death. My question today is, which journey are you on? Are you walking triumphantly? Or do you feel like you're on a death march? Do you feel utterly cast down, pushed away? Maybe there's a big family problem that you're going through. Maybe work is horrible. Maybe you just broke up with an important friend. Maybe you just don't know why, but you can't get rid of these feelings of of being frustrated or angry or sad or depressed. Maybe there's some kind of a, a struggle, like a sin or a temptation that you, you know somehow isn't right, but you just can't seem to shake it. Friends, today, I'm here to remind you that Jesus walked the journey. Jesus walked the journey that you're on now. If you're walking triumphantly and feeling like you got the world at your feet, Jesus knew that feeling too. He came into Jerusalem as a king. And if you feel like you're just one step closer to death today, Jesus knew that exact feeling as well. I want to encourage you because it says in Hebrews, he was tempted in every way as we are. Jesus experienced the same struggles that we're having. He experienced the same difficulty. He went through the same pain and agony that you have. And yet he didn't give in. He walked steadily on the triumphant and terrifying journey all the way to the end. And you know what? He did that for you so that your journey no longer has to be terrifying. It says in the Bible that we are victorious in Christ. And that's why Paul said it's a triumphant procession that he always carries us in. So what's your procession look like? What does your journey look like today? Maybe, can we go to the next page? Maybe you feel like this rose, trampled in your job, trampled in your family, trampled in your friendships. The idea of, of the, the smell being the aroma of Christ, Paul is likening to, some people believe that as the generals would walk through Rome, that they would throw rose petals down at their feet. And then the priests of Rome would carry these big incense things, and they would wave them around, and there'd be these smells that were happening. And as a king, as a triumphant king, you felt, wow, this is amazing. And as you squashed each rose petal under your feet, the smell of the roses came up and was this amazing fragrance of victory in your life. But as a slave, the same smell, the same roses being trampled, the same struggle, is the smell of death. So which smell are we today? Are we trampled in our jobs and families and friendships? Today is the day that Jesus wants to remind you that he was already trampled for you. In the Old Testament, all the way back hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, it said, by his wounds we are healed. It says he was crushed for our iniquities. That means the sin that we committed, the things that we did that have separated us from God. And you know what? The things done to us. As little children, it's, it's, I have you know, two little boys now, and it's amazing to me to think about all the struggles that I grew up having things done to me that, that I didn't even have any control of. And maybe there's some of you who have gone through that. Maybe being forced to move to a new community when you were really young and losing your best friends. 
Maybe it's just as simple as that. Maybe there's more difficult things that you've gone through in your life. And the hurt and the lies and the destruction that those things have caused, that, that broken families have caused, the, the hurt and the destruction that, that friends in school caused you. Almost impossible to let go. And you're feeling trampled and you're feeling let down. And Jesus is coming alongside of you right now and saying, I already walked that journey. I want to walk this one with you. And together we're going to turn it from a journey to death to a journey to life because I already took all the penalty of all the things that you've done and all the things that have been done to you. I took all of that on myself at the cross. And I'll walk with you to that very moment when that horrible thing happened to you. And I'll take you to the very moment when you did that horrible thing. And I want to set you free from that. That's triumphant living. That's a triumphant procession. A triumphant procession isn't ignoring reality. It's not pretending like everything's okay. It's being able to look with the courage that only comes from God directly into that situation and saying, I'm going. I'm going into that situation and I will not quit until I see his victory played out in there. The triumphant journey is the one that goes to your friend who has cancer and will not stop praying until they're healed. The triumphant journey is the one who keeps going even when it seems like all hope is lost. Because Christ in us is the hope of glory, Paul says. Christ in us is the hope of glory. So where are you at in your journey today? Maybe you're like my friend Howard. We'll get to that in a minute. In Jesus, your journey is not being trampled in your jobs and your families and your friendships. We'll go to the next one. Your journey is victory in your future victory in your families and victory in the purpose that God has given you. I'm so excited today and this year that the theme of our family is being led by the Spirit because you have an infinitely amazing opportunity to be led by the Spirit. You have people around you that love you dearly and want to walk through, walk through this with you. And today is an amazing day, if you haven't already, to start this journey, to start this journey to victory. The journey to victory that sets you free from struggles that you have in your life, that gives you hope, that gives you joy, that cannot be taken away by any circumstance. The journey to victory is a journey that starts by understanding what God has already done and placing our hope in what he's going to do. I think of the 12 spies in Genesis as one example. 12 people went into the promised land and they were told to take a report because God promised them, so it's called the promised land, God promised them that they were going to take this. And they were sent in to get a report and bring it back to the rest of the people about what was going to happen. 12 people saw the same thing. 10 of them came back and said, we looked at them and they looked like giants and they became giants to us. It's all in their perspective. The perspective that they had was these people are giants and they're impossible. So what's the giants that we're facing in our lives now? What's the struggles that we're going through? Those 10 spies came back and said, those giants made us feel like grasshoppers and so we're grasshoppers. <laughs> but the other two came back and they didn't put their eyes on the size of the giants, but they put their eyes on the promises of God. They opened up their Bibles, so to speak, or we can today, and they remembered their Bible, they remembered what their Bible said, and they allowed God's Spirit to say to them, your promise, God, is bigger than my giant. Your promise is bigger than the struggle that I have. Your promise is bigger than the difficulty that I face in my family, in my job, in my friendships, in the relationships that I have. Your promise is bigger than the impossibility that I face in the church that I'm ministering in. It's bigger than the impossible problem. It's bigger than the health issue. It's your promise, God. It says in Christ, everything is yes and amen. So what's the problem? <laughs> I don't see any. I don't know. Maybe you're like Howard. I think Howard's on the next slide here. Howard is a friend of ours who originally he uh, came into the aroma 
because friends of ours had gone to his restaurant in another part of Shimon where we're in, and they just struck up conversation with him. And at that point in his life, Howard had um, known, he had a lot of family problems in his life. A really broken family situation and, and struggles with other relationships and his, his pay wage uh, would be considered illegal, below minimum wage here in the States. Um, wasn't paid well, didn't have a lot of hope, so to speak. And he came into the Aroma and he began making friends with us. And as we began to share our love with him, the aroma began to attract him. He was attracted to the aroma and within a matter of a few months made a decision to follow the Lord and just got baptized in Easter about a month ago. So Howard is now a brother in Christ. This is, these are some pictures of Howard. Uh, we're in a coffee shop and we don't have one of those cool baptismal tanks and we try to talk to like six different churches and it just didn't work out. So we said, we're still doing it on Easter, so we're going to buy a Rubbermaid container, and you need to kneel down in the Rubbermaid, and we're going to dump buckets of water on you. So we got a pan, and we just dumped them. We just dunked him kind of with that. So Howard's got baptized. Howard is the aroma. Howard's the aroma. Everywhere he goes, he just oozes God's love, and he's beginning to spread that aroma to other people. There's already been some restoration in his family. His father and, and him are talking without fighting now, which is kind of a big deal. And, and Howard's beginning to see God's purposes unveiled in his life. It's not a terrible and terrifying journey anymore. It's a triumphant journey. There's hope. God planted a seed of his kingdom in Howard's heart, and it's going to grow up into a big tree, and people are going to come, and they're going to smell the aroma. They will become the aroma, and they will themselves start to spread the aroma. Maybe you're like Howard. Maybe you're like Lewis and Renee. Maybe you're like Sarah. There's lots of other people. Who are you like? No matter what struggles you're having right now, no matter what difficulties you're facing, God is coming today and he's saying, you are the aroma. You're the aroma of Christ and this is your opportunity. This is your moment to receive all that God has for you. I love that in, in our faith, it's not just a one-time occurrence that you pray a prayer and then you become a Christian and then God leaves you alone and you struggle on your own until you die and go to heaven. It's not like that. You're not, he's not far away. He's not aloof. I, I personally struggle with that a lot and I'm learning more about why. Part of it has to do with some of my family relationships. That in my family, there's been sometimes a sense of, of aloofness. And I feel sometimes like God's far away. God's not far away. He's near. The Bible says very clearly, some believe he's far off, but he's actually quite near. Another part of the Bible says he's, we have someone who's closer than a friend. He's not far off. He's close. What's, what's he doing in your life today? I want to encourage you to see the journey that you're on, not as a journey of terrifying marching towards death, but a journey of triumphant victory in Christ. Not so that we can brag about it or, or get prideful or anything like that, but so that we can understand and live on, stand on, and live from the promises and the truth of God's Word. That this year will be a banner year for our life in the Spirit. I want to give you three things that you can start doing to be the aroma. It's our last page. To be the aroma, I want to encourage you to start by praying. <clears throat> and my quick story is from the Bible, because it's a pretty good book. There's a man named Elijah. And in Elijah's time, there weren't many people that were following God for part of his time. And they were following instead this other God named Baal. And there were 450 prophets of Baal, 450 people that were like, hey, Baal is real and your God is not. And Elijah stood up and challenged him. And Elijah stood up and said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this old style, awesome competition. Okay, we're going to put God to the test. Over here, in, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about how to try to make this like a WWF match. Um, and so like in the left corner we have, you know, and then we got like Mike Tyson over here in the right corner. So in the left corner, we have 450 prophets of Baal. And the crowd's like, ah. And so, they're, so these 450 prophets, they're going to put a, a sacrifice on the altar and they're going to pray to their God. And if their God rains down fire on it, then we know that Baal's real. Then on the other side, we got Elijah by himself. 
And Elijah's going to do the same thing. Sacrifice on the altar. And if God answers by fire, then he's the real God. But Elijah thought that this wasn't cool enough just to, you know, make it equal. So he asked for some people to take his sacrifice and to douse it in water, like three times. Which, if you like taking numbers further than you probably should, three times in three days, Jesus rose from the dead and he was baptized and rose again. Elijah stood there and in faith he prayed and God answered. The prophets of Baal stood over here and they yelled for their God to do something all day and nothing happened. And in that one moment, our God answered by fire. And he rained down his fire and it sucked up all the water and it sucked up all the sacrifice and it burned the altar down. There was nothing left. And this, this one prayer, this one God come, sparked a revival in the whole nation. Which one prayer are you going to pray that's going to spark a revival in the whole nation? Which one prayer are you going to pray that's going to rain down fire in your school? It's going to rain down fire in your church. It's going to rain down fire in your family. You read on to the end of the chapter and Elijah prays again. Elijah promises, because he feels the word of the Lord, is that rain is going to come. But Israel is in a drought, so there's no water anywhere. And Elijah says, rain's coming. You guys better get ready. And so he goes up to the top of the mountain and he, he puts his, hand, his head down into his lap and he starts praying. And then he tells his servant to go down and check. Can you see any clouds? Can you see anything? And he says, no, mm -mm, nothing. So in one sense, Elijah, in one minute, he's got this fire rain down now. And it's awesome and it's cool. And I love when fire rains down now. But there's also a perseverance in prayer that comes. There's also God sometimes... It, it doesn't say he's slow, it says he's patient because he wants no one to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. And so Elijah, in one moment, fire, fall down now. And in the other moment, he comes and he prays to God and it says he prayed seven times. And it was finally on the seventh time that the servant goes and he says, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. So he prayed and 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 he prayed, and he prayed seven times. And on the seventh time, finally, we saw a cloud this big. And Elijah said, all right, the rain of revival is coming. Let's go. Sometimes you pray, and in one moment, the fire falls. And sometimes you pray, and it takes seven years. Sometimes you pray, and it takes an entire lifetime to see one of your friends come to know the Lord. Jesus says in the New Testament, he told the story of the unjust judge because he wants us to keep praying and never give up. Keep praying and never give up. Prayer is the real and first work of God's revival. It's the real and first work of being led by the Spirit. In Romans it says if you are led by the Spirit, you pray prayers that people don't even understand. And you have a sense of God adopting you into his family in a way that is not even able to be explained in human reasoning. You have this intense encounter with God. That's what it's like to be a part of God's family. And the first step is prayer. If you don't know how to pray, I'm sure there's some people here that would love to help. And for me, a lot of my growth in prayer has happened from a few simple prayer journals, some, some really easy prayer teaching, like With Christ in the School of Prayer by Andrew Murray. It's really old and hard to understand English. But if you slow, it's only like two pages a day. And it's 30 days, so you can keep reading it over and over again like Proverbs. And then just start journaling and writing down what you feel like God's saying to you. And read the Bible. And take Psalms and take other passages of Scripture and use those as prayers. Those are God's promises, and when you speak them back to Him, He responds. That's His Word. And He says His Word never comes back void. His Word never doesn't do what it says it's going to do. And that is a double negative. And a double negative means a positive. Okay? Do you, are you following what I'm saying here? He never doesn't not follow His Word. Okay? I'm no English major, but I know that that means he does do his word. The first thing you can do is pray. The second thing you can do is give. The Bible talks a lot about money. And I know it's awkward for us to talk about money sometimes in church, but Jesus did. I think that there's a very key, important thing that happens when we are willing to give financially. And I, I agree that we should give our time, and I agree that we should give our talents. I totally agree with that. That's my next point. Right now... I want to slow down and I want to encourage you to see money the way God sees it. It's a test. It's a test. It's an opportunity. And in Malachi, it says, 
test me. It's one of the few places in the Bible that God says, test me. Test me and see what I'm going to do. He says, don't hold back the tithes and the offerings. A tithe is 10% of your income. If you want to have the best business partner ever, start with 10%. That's God's business deal. 10% and he takes care of you. It's all God's money. He gave you your job. He gave you everything else. So you start with 10% and then tithes are 10% and offerings are above that. An offering is any time you feel God moving you to do something special above and beyond that. And my example for this is Cornelius. Cornelius is in Acts, I think chapter 9 and 10, right in there. And in, in this passage of scripture, Cornelius doesn't know God yet. He doesn't know Jesus. But he prays and he gives to people. He prays and he gives. And an angel visits him. I wouldn't mind being visited by an angel. An angel visits him and says, Cornelius, your tithes and your offerings and your prayers have come up to God as a memorial. So God's in heaven and he's waiting for us to do something. He's waiting for us to pray like Elijah and he's waiting for us to give like Cornelius. And as Cornelius gave, even before he knew God, God responded and God moved supernaturally to give Peter a vision to go to Cornelius' house and to tell him about Jesus. How cool is that? All because Cornelius was faithful to pray and to give. He didn't even know Jesus yet. You guys are already way above him because you know Jesus. So I want to encourage you to pray and to give. And it might start with like a dollar. It might start with saying, you know, I can go without Starbucks on Sunday mornings. I'm going to put three bucks in the offering plate. That's a great start. And you know what? I believe that God is going to bless you as you do that. I'm not here to talk about a get-rich-quick scheme or God wants to make you so rich you can't even do anything. Although if you do read Malachi, it says, test me, give me the tithes and offerings so that I will pour out a blessing that's so big you can't contain it. That's what the Bible says. I'm not making this stuff up. You can't even make it up. It's so good. I want to encourage you to pray like Elijah, to give like Cornelius, and to go like Jesus. To go on your journey, your triumphant journey, because you are the aroma. I want to encourage you, even if it's a journey, even if it's a journey unto death, like Jesus, you go into that journey. You go into that road as a triumphant victor. This life is just a vapor. All that you have in this life, this 70 years, this 80 years, this 90 years, the Bible says is just a vapor. It's just a, and you're done. A, and you're done. Do you understand? In the, in, the, in the realm of eternity, in all of eternity that we're going to have to be in heaven, what you are going through today, good or bad, is... Is that, is that starting to make sense? Like, okay? All it is is a... Okay? So when we're talking about the struggles that we're going through, and trust me, I've had struggles. When we're, when we're talking about saying no to sin or, or going to that other friend of ours that hates Jesus and talking about Jesus with him and showing him God's love... When we're, talking about, when we're talking about being the bridge between different cultures, cultures that hate each other, people that are fighting and being a bridge between them, being one who brings unity and peace, being a peacemaker, we're talking about doing these impossible things. It feels like a death journey, but it's a life journey. I want to encourage you to pray like Elijah, give like Cornelius, and go like Jesus. Jesus wants to go with you. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, and this is my last verse, is in Exodus chapter 33. It's a great story of Moses starting with praying like Elijah and then going to God and spending that time with him and being invited to have intimacy with God. It says he talked with God face to face like a friend. And then Moses says, God, you told me to do this thing. You told me to lead these people. I don't know how I'm going to do it. He was just honest with God about how much he was struggling. He said, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And God said, my presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. God's presence wants to go with you. And that ties in perfectly with our theme of being filled and led by the Spirit. My presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. When you bring everything to God in prayer. It says the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So when you take all that, all that stuff, all that issue, and you just put it in your hand here, and you say, all right, God, I'm giving you my family. I don't understand it. It's really frustrating. I'm giving you my job. I want to quit. I'm giving you school. Can't stand my teachers. My friends all make fun of me. 
I'll give you my hurts and my brokenness from the past. From when I was just a little boy, when I was just a little girl. I'm giving that to you, God. And you gotta, you gotta do something with it. You gotta, it's right here. You gotta do something with it, God. He says, my presence will go with you. And I'll give you rest. His presence is the difference maker. It's the, it's the thing that caused Daniel and his friends to be ten times better than everyone else. His presence is the difference maker. It's the thing that gives you peace in the midst of a crazy storm. And that's why Jesus could command the storm to stop. His presence is the difference maker. And then he goes a step further and he says, now show me your glory. Moses had this intimate encounter with God. And God wants to do that with each and every one of you through his spirit in here. Through his spirit in here. I just want to, can I just pray for him quick and then sure. hand it back over here? God, I just pray for my friends. And I don't, I don't know a lot of them. Never talked with them before. Never, I don't know their stories, but you know them. And Holy Spirit, you, you were there. You were there when they were lied to, when they were hurt. You were there when those lies and hurts turned into offenses and now they've got a thorn stuck in the side of their flesh and they can't get it out. You were there when, when mom left. You were there when, when dad hit. You were there in each of those circumstances. You were there in every moment. And you want to take us back on the journey to that very moment. And you want to show us how you were there. And how you want to bring healing in that very moment. How you were standing right beside us. And in all the hurt and all the desperation, you wrapped your arms around us. And you want to carry us back to victory. You were there with us, God. You want to heal those hurts, those lies and offenses. You want to restore us, like it says in Psalms. Restore us for your name's sake. You want to bring us into new encounters with your word. You want the Bible to be alive to us. You want us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be controlled and compelled by love. Not feelings and emotions, not emotionalism like the world thinks if it feels good, it's love. That's junk. Love gives. Love sacrifices. Love speaks the truth. Love desires the best for the other person. Love lays down itself. God, that you would fill us up with a fresh encounter of your love by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray for all my friends that they would pray like Elijah and give like Cornelius and they would go like Jesus all the way to the ends of the earth wherever you're calling them to and even across the street. Thank you so much, Jesus.